and my fine colleague. I'm Marcus Enoch. I'm a professor of transport strategy at Loughborough University. Thank you. And now we're going to take you through the talk. So if we can bring up the slides. We're going to start this talk with some transport basics. It's uh, what Marcus might call Transport 101. Um, part of the reason to do this is that we ensure that we're all sort of speaking a common language about transport related issues. So how are we doing on the slides there? We're on number two. Fine. Um, so transport, we all know what it is. We have an idea what, what it is in our mind. But um, in this talk, um, we want to emphasize the route specific definition that we're talking about considering moving people and goods through space and time. It's very much a physical mobility definition. So we might stretch this definition a bit later on to include things like packets in the Internet. But for now, we're going to keep our feet on the ground. So what does transport do or provide for you? It affords all of us mobility. In other words, it allows a different way for us and all our things to get around. We call this a derived demand because every movement ought to have a reason or a purpose, a sort of journey purpose, if you like. And we'll look at some of the reason why people travel shortly, but for transport to function, you have to have transport providers, those who create the supply. So you might want to think about this as a supply and demand model. So you can think about the supply of seats on buses and trains or the sales of cars or the use of cars in your own country. All of these physical things make up the supply side of transport. And when we use these things to travel, we make up the demand as travelers, passengers and drivers. Now, we're going to look at how this demand typically pans out in the United Kingdom, both in pictures and in demand terms. So in this third slide, um, we have three examples of our mobile lives, and this is before the pandemic struck. Just to illustrate what travel was like, if you forgot, over the last three months. On the left, we've got a picture of the main road heading into a city center, central business district near Kowloon. You can see it's got signs of serious congestion. Lots of people are on the brakes. And so although all of this creates a lot of mobility, at the same time, it brings a whole host of negative impacts. These include air pollution, road crashes, which lead to death and injury, greenhouse gases and generating further gases, urban heat islands, noise, congestion, as I mentioned, but in particular lost time or loss of green spaces or other space, and also a general degradation of our environment more broadly, um, both in city areas, but also in rural areas as well. Um, and our mobile lives also contribute to a lot of increased stress levels, um, including things like asthma attacks and um, during bad air days, as well as many of us simply driving or riding in a car, reducing our own level of fitness activity, um, if, if you like, reducing our own health overall. Um, another thing that uh, um, the mobility systems have the ability to do, but not always, is they do tend to cut cities into pieces and cause severance in between different neighborhoods, as well as visual intrusion. However, um, they do provide mobility. On the right, um, we see at the top right there, you see a very crowded train heading into London in the morning. Many of our trains were well over the seat capacity, leaving many commuters to stand almost the whole way of their journey. On the bottom right, we see what it's like when you experience lack of space um, in a pedestrian only environment. Um, the crush of the crowd, if you like. Uh, if you've ever been shopping um, in, in earlier mid-December on Oxford Street in London, you'll get a feeling of what I'm talking about. 
Um, and apparently some people pay good money to see this sort of thing in concerts and festivals every year. But this is not something we're seeing this year. Um, but what I want to highlight is that we simply run out of space after a certain level of people in the demand area come into a confined area. So now that we've had a pictorial look at this, I want to look at how it breaks down for transport in the UK using some stats. So we've made some pie charts for you based on um, transport statistics, Great Britain. And on the left, what we've got is trips, total trips per person by the purpose. So why are you going on this trip? And these are the standard eight reasons that we use. And what we find is that leisure trips make the greatest part of our trips. It's followed closely by shopping, commuting, and trips that are linked to educational um, purposes or educational reasons, such as taking your children to primary school in the morning if you walk or if you drive. Um, so all of these trips facilitate the derived demand. They're trips to buy things, go to work, and go to school. You might be surprised to know that a, a small 15% is due to commuting. Certainly doesn't feel like that if you're on the Northern Line during peak hour before the coronavirus. So we make just under a thousand trips per year that are all counted and we make them in a variety of ways. We call this modes or modal share in transport jargon. 61% of all our trips are as car drivers or car passengers or in a small van. 29% of our trips are by feet, by walking, and two wheels on a bicycle. Another 9% of trips sweeps up all the buses, trains, and tubes, and the last bits um, get left for ferries, planes, taxis, and motorbikes. You'll see on this that it says 0%. That doesn't mean there's no trips for that mode. It just means that the percentage is so small that it doesn't show up on the graphic. But then on the 23rd of March, it all changed in the UK, just like it did in many other countries with the announcement of the UK wide lockdown for the majority of people. And it's over to you, Marcus, to tell us what happened. Thanks, James. I'm trying to get back to my... Uh previous uh, system managed to lose my slide count <laughs> could we move the slide on please thanks okay so uh, transport during lockdown so 16th of march 2020 and prime minister boris johnson announces that uh, coronavirus pandemic has arrived on the uk shores and that from the 23rd of march uh, all non-essential travel uh, should stop so what that meant was, is that we went into lockdown. Basically, anybody with their health concerns, uh, vulnerable groups, so-called people over 70, <laughs> um, people with heart conditions or um, cancer drugs and so on, um, were required to stay at home all the time and isolate themselves. Uh, other people, um, if you could work from home, you were strongly encouraged to work from home. Um, indeed, you were only supposed to go to work if your jobs were seen as essential. So lots of people uh, no longer went to work anymore. Um, you were allowed out um, if you were to buy food or medicine, and also you were allowed to go out once a day to exercise. What all of this meant was, is that essentially um, businesses, shops, entertainment venue, uh, churches and mosques and so on, schools, um, all basically, many of them shut down. And what this did is it essentially, it switched demand off. And what that also had the impact of doing was um, it sort of essentially, it, it defined, redefined what, what we meant by the need to travel. And what this resulted in is what you can see on the screen. So we've got empty railways, stations, and empty trains. Um, we've got empty roads. This picture here was taken uh, during the, the rush hour, um, just outside where I live in Bedford. Um, and yeah, empty roads. Uh, and the high street, this is Bedford High Street, and uh, a lot fewer people on the high street. 
Um, the only kind of sort of general activity that did change, we did see some change in use. So more people cycling uh, on certain trips and so on. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a minute. But the point is, is that um, really in terms of like a response, uh, people obeyed the lockdown, which I think surprised government the extent to which people did. And, uh, and so this is what we see. And so actually, in principle, what we have is suddenly we've gone from having a system where predominantly um, we're worried about overcrowding and congestion being a problem, too much demand for the available supply. And suddenly we were in a world where it was almost there was far too much supply for the available demand. And that is, uh, is quite different. OK, uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, so in terms of experiences i mean some people obviously did continue to travel and um, this picture on the left is is from china uh, in late january and there there's some innovative ways of uh, of addressing uh, the pandemic and the fear of catching the virus and you can see some fascinating uh, masks that have been uh, developed from all kinds of products like a, a grapefruit um, a water bottle a cabbage and a sanitary pad uh, so some quite inventive uh, solutions there. Um, so when people did travel, uh, not so much in the UK, but you did see uh, innovation in how people got around. Um, and then the other thing that happened was is that people found other ways, alternative ways of meeting uh, their needs. So um, home shopping, for instance, uh, that uh, significantly increased. Um, so in Australia, for instance, 7% uh, of all uh, shopping for physical uh, retail sales, and that's where you actually buy something um, physical, uh, they increased from 7% in March 2019 to 11% in April 2020. So that's basically a 50% increase um, in trips. Um, in the UK, online grocery sales uh, surged by more than a quarter, apparently. And that assumed that you could actually get a slot. So Tesco's, Asda particularly, they inc dramatically increased their provision of home shopping uh, opportunities. But, um, but many people uh, couldn't actually access them. So there was suppressed demand, if you like. But that was one thing. Um, another uh, way that we changed our behaviour is that um, when we're not working, we, we, a lot of us had uh, meetings online and so on through Microsoft Teams or collaborate or other such uh, online platforms um, and then the the zoom phenomena family quizzes that kind of thing uh, took off as well so a few different ways of that um, another statistic um, was that uh, amazon uh, last year december was obviously the busiest year with christmas and so on people buying presents to send to people and so on <clears throat> sales uh, this april were actually 20 percent higher on amazon than they were last christmas and so that shows you um, the impact of coronavirus there as well. So uh, if we could move to the next slide. Um, what this means um, in a kind of a, a nice graph, as we like to show, is, um, is what happened uh, to travel generally. So essentially, overall, uh, the amount of travel that people did uh, dropped from 100% um, to 15% of overall travel. In other words, it dropped by 85% on pre-existing uh, levels and that was that information comes from people's mobile phone data um, for all modes and then if we look at individual modes uh, what you can see is some interesting uh, things happening so what you see is on the left hand side and um, the vertical axis uh, 100% 200% 300% that represents an index of the normal amount of travel taken back uh, in say February these are Department for Transport figures. And essentially what you can see is, is that as we move uh, into March from February, is that a certain number of modes start to drop. So for instance, uh, the black line, that is rail travel, national rail travel. And what you can see to that is that, is that it started to drop uh, towards, uh, from mid-March onwards, uh, so that by the start of April, uh, national rail travel is less than 10% of normal levels, okay? And similarly, bus is slightly above that. Um, so massive hit uh, to public transport services. 
Um, the blue line, that represents cars, and they dropped to 40% of normal levels. What's interesting about cars is they reckon that um, the level of car traffic we had at the start of April is about the same as what we had in 1955. So that's quite a stark statistic indeed. And the orange line, that represents heavy goods vehicles. So that's the, the lorries that are delivering stuff. And you can see that they fell as well. Lots of industries not working anymore. So a lot of that sort of traffic is gone. Um, and then the other line we've got on the graph there is the green line. And this is the one that increased. And what this shows is, uh, is cycling. And so it's a very noisy line that, but um, essentially the overall trend was uh, up quite a lot. What's interesting you'll see are the spikes and they are actually weekends. So cycle traffic increased, but actually most of it was done on the weekend, um, which is interesting. So, um, and cycling, um, lots of uh, examples in the press about, you know, bike shops were open basically to, to help uh, essential workers like the NHS people uh, get to and from their uh, hospital and so on to work. And, um, and they were fine, they were found they were selling out of bicycles, uh, some of them within a couple of hours, they'd sold all their stock. Um, incredible sort of stories, queues, weeks to wait for new bikes, uh, over a week to get your bicycle repaired, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, quite a big difference. Okay, um, so if we move on to the next slide, this is the other side of, uh, of what happened to travel. So this is actually uh, virtual travel, if you like. What this shows is um, uh, internet usage uh, since uh, the start of this year. And uh, the UK is represented by the blue line. And what you can see is, uh, again, an index figure. So 100% uh, was uh, set at, at the start of the year. And you can see that since then, uh, internet traffic steadily increased um, anyway until towards the end of February. And then there was uh, a jump that happened um, as the lockdown kind of kicked in. So these figures here, it's called a moving average, it's trailing seven days. So if you see the red uh, dashed line with the L on it, that's when lockdown was applied. And um, what you can see is on the day that lockdown was applied, basically uh, the graph jumped up um, to sort of like 40% higher than it had been at the start of the year. So internet traffic uh, increased by around 40%, in other words. Um, and then unfortunately our graph runs out in the middle of April, but I've heard that since then that, that actually it's increased. Um, one fear had be that if everyone suddenly went from doing things physically to virtually, then uh, people wouldn't be able to, um, to get online anymore, that basically the capacity of the internet wouldn't be high enough. And I had a chat, to a, a friend of mine uh, works at Ofcom, and he mentions that um, actually, um, what, act what happened is, is that um, over the recent years, broadband providers have, have, have been developing capacity to meet the needs of uh, Netflix users in the evenings. And so actually during the day before the lockdown, uh, there was a lot of unused capacity in the internet system. This is on average and there's obviously differences in local areas and so on. But uh, so essentially, um, fortunately, if you like, uh, Netflix has saved everybody because um, what we've actually done is we've increased use of broadband um, during the off peak for broadband, if that makes sense. So, so that um, wasn't as bad as, as what was feared initially. Um, just to say as well, that uh, in a YouGov survey last week, um, they found in a survey of users that 5% uh, of people had previously uh, worked from home before coronavirus, and that figure is now 49%. So they reckon from that survey uh, that, that um, working from home has essentially gone up 10 times. So another uh, interesting statistic. Okay, and the other thing about that one is, is that 69% um, of, about, about two thirds of people um, actually like working from home and may want to keep doing it after the lockdown ends. So that's an implication for the future. Okay, next one, please. Right, so, there have been several good outcomes of lockdowns, one of which is that um, people in um, California, uh, this is Los Angeles, can now see the San Gabriel Mountains, which they haven't been able to do for years. Uh, similar views of the Himalayas in Northern India, 
have been allowed for the first time. If, um, there's various pictures on TV showing Delhi, Shanghai, um, where the smog is now gone, and uh, and so we could have cleaner air, and that's wonderful. And um, we've recorded the biggest CO2 uh, carbon dioxide uh, savings uh, since World War II. So another good implication of people not flying anymore and and uh, and less car trips. Um, people report being able to hear wildlife again for the first time forever. And, uh, and people able to spend more quality time with their families, uh, another good outcome. But on the other hand, if uh, we're moving on to the next slide, thanks, um, there are also some serious uh, impacts as well. So the World Economic Outlook report from the IMF published last week reckons that coronavirus is gonna cost the UK economy 400 billion pounds. They also predict that uh, we're gonna take a 10% uh, hit to GDP from 2020, uh, which is again is is massive. Um, Bank of England, meanwhile, they predict uh, that one of their worst uh, statistics, um, well, not worst predictions, but um, worst case predictions, was they reckon that GDP could fall by 14%, which is the worst GDP fall since 1706. They also mentioned that uh, unemployment could hit 20%. In a worst case, that's six million people out of a job as a result of coronavirus. Um, other figures, somewhat, but it'll, uh, unemployment could increase by a, by a, a million people, uh, two million people, that kind of range. It's a significant impact. Also, uh, terrible effects on people's mental health, uh, domestic abuse. Um, uh, charities record uh, increased calls to their for help, uh, impact on children's education. They've not been to school for weeks, many of them. Um, it's horrendous. Uh, meanwhile, for public transport, for instance, um, they reckon that um, UK buses needed a 400 million pound bailout. They asked for a billion, they got 400 million pounds. So bus operators are suffering um, and rail subsidies, particularly interesting. Um, typically they're 360 million a month to pay for UK to subsidise UK railways at the moment, at the moment, they're running at a billion pounds a month. That's three times more. And what they've also found is that um, typically, uh, because passenger numbers have gone down by ninety percent, we're essentially paying uh, thirty times more per trip than we would normally in subsidy. So that you get the figure of a hundred pounds per journey subsidy for every rail journey. And um, for aviation. Um, so far, seven airlines have gone bust, um, and IATA, the international airline organization, reckon that um, by the end of 2020, um, aviation airlines will have lost £68 billion. Right, I think, uh, is that over to you now, James? I think it is. Um, so all of this has been a huge uh if you like, natural life experiment that wasn't necessarily planned, um, not from the beginning, and it wasn't planned to happen, but it's happened and we're in it. And in some ways, the lifting of the lockdown and the way that it gets lifted in steps or all of a sudden is a little bit of another natural experiment. Um, and we find ourselves confronted with new rules, new regulations, new behaviors as transport operators try to adapt their systems so we can still manage to achieve some form of mobility. And on the left hand side, we've got this plan your joint journey, avoid public transport if at all possible. And um, so we have the prime minister telling us stay vigilant, control the virus, and um, rather than saying stay at home. Um, and, um, um, and, and, the, and the message there is, don't take public transport if you can avoid it because public transport can be crowded and susceptible to spreading the virus and using your own car might be safer or better or better still if you can walk or ride your bike for essential journeys. Yet this emphasis on the car over public transport goes firmly against the general principles of sustainability where bus and trains are thought to be the backbones of mobility, 
and have very high efficiencies and relatively low impacts per person. So where are we now with the lockdown lifting? If you can get a bus or train, then you must sit or stand in such a way that's physically distant. Uh, on this right-hand side, you see the cleaner has blocked off so many seats, it's not immediately clear to me where, where I am allowed to sit. Still, the vehicles are being very clean um, and many taxis are being cleaned before and after each trip. So um, this hygiene factor is really coming into play um, in, in a very strong way. And if we go on to this next slide, um, we see some other new forms of potential mobility emerging around the themes of personalized or protected travel. Um, so this, this shows uh, the Metro in Medellin in Colombia, and they reacted very rapidly to COVID-19. They put these stickers everywhere, showing people exactly where you can and cannot stand, and also where you can and cannot sit. Um, they had a really proactive response to the health and safety, and they've rolled that out in a public and transparent way. Or I'll just say this as sideline, um, all of their PPE, their personal protective equipment was purchased through open bids, um, through open auctions, and it's all available on the web. And so their, their timing was fast, their response was fast, it was open, it was clear, and um, it was very simple in the sense that it was one message that applied to everybody. Um, however, one thing that you should take away from this in terms of transport, supply and demand, you're seeing 18 or 20 people in this carriage, which probably normally carries something like 170 to 250. So with this increased space comes the issues of financial sustainability and low efficiencies. And when we move on to this next slide, you'll see the other ways that things are starting to pop up and appear on the horizon. Some happen very quickly, like on the top right, we see um, London and TFL, Transport for London, stepping up and, um, and widening the pedestrian areas to aid the amount of distance that people have walking on the footway and on the expanded sidewalks and pavements um, and, and giving extra space to bicycles and scooters. We've also seen um, this idea about electric scooters being redressed under UK legislation. So should they be allowed on roads or not? It's been a bit of a debate and that debate's been sort of kick-started by this. And we're also seeing potentially um, some new and creative ideas arise for how we might achieve distancing on aviation. Um, so what might happen if we turn a three seat configuration into a one plus one configuration um, as the lockdown lifts? Um, and we don't exactly know how all of these things are going to pan out, but they're, they're coming at us in some ways in small steps and we're trying to learn as we go along. And in some other cases, we're seeing some large shifts um, where people are moving the permanent features. And we're starting to step into this area, um, which we're calling the fog of the future. Next slide. Yes, where next? Um, so we're gonna slow down a little bit. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what we might see in the future and what kind of questions we need to ask about transport systems as we adapt to this new normal. Over to you, Marcus. Okay, so if we could have the next slide, please. Okay, brilliant. So um, we just put together a few thoughts on the future and we've, we've come up with a few more and we thought we'd, we'd sort of punt these out there for the moment. And then um, we've got some questions on the, on the slide after. 
um, which we're putting to you as the audience. Um, so one, I've spoken to a few uh, operators recently about what they see the future is going to be. And um, some of it's quite scary. So um, one of them was uh, chatting to a bus company general manager. He reckons um, it's going to take two years for the bus industry to get back to anything close to normality. And he sees that they're going to lose 20% uh, of trips permanently because people will be too frightened to use the bus in the future or because people have found alternatives. So what you're starting to see is um, increases in sales of secondhand cars, for instance, and um, from people who didn't have a car before. That's obviously quite serious uh, for the bus industry. Um, there's a lot of um, stuff being put in the press uh, recently um, about hospitality um, and how they want the, the relaxation of the two meter social distance to one meter. Um, the view from what I've heard from, from a bus manager is that essentially on public transport, that's not gonna make a fundamental difference. Um, essentially the seats on a bus are less than a meter apart. And so if you're gonna maintain two meters or one meter, <laughs> you might get a few extra people on a bus, but, but, but basically the only time that buses become economically viable again, commercially anyway, is um, is if you get away with a dis social distancing altogether and you you basically have um, risk-based assessments on each bus and you have people wearing masks and so on and have them all facing forward, which isn't a problem on a bus and, uh, you know, and people behaving themselves. Um, and then there is an interesting thing about business models as well. Um, essentially, uh, a lot of bus companies are now thinking, how can we change ticketing systems? Season tickets, for instance, might no longer be attractive. Myself, for instance, I in the past, I had a season ticket because I travelled from Bedford to Loughborough, um, say, four days a week on average. And it made sense to have a season ticket. But if after this, I'm only going to travel, say, two days or three days a week to Loughborough, and the season ticket doesn't make economic sense. So transport companies are starting to seriously look again at carne solutions, where you buy a block of, say, 20 journeys for the price of 18, that kind of thing. So we might see more of that. Um, and then uh, Rachel Aldred at University of Westminster, she did a, a, a widely cited uh, article where she talks about the fact that um, kicking all these people off public transport is going to lead to an extra million cars on the road. I'll just Which jump is in there. Um, yes. as well um, and <clears throat> uh, with some further thoughts so some of the trends that we're seeing now as lockdown lifts and as we adjust to new normal will certainly have big effects on the future so um, in some recent polls done by Euromonitor International they found um, with respect to um, commuting and car use, that 13% of those polled said that they would shift to their cars permanently. Um, whereas before they might've used the car sometimes mixed with public transport. Um, some are saying, you know, I've kind of got used to using my car now. Um, and this, in, in terms of overall effect, if this 13% was spread across the globe, if you like, that leads, that leads to roughly 2 million uh, extra cars um, that will be on the road. So um, these are quite big effects. Um, at the same time, um, in the EU 27, so the 27 states that make up the EU currently in early 2020, new car sales were down by about 26%. It's not really clear when that market will pick up again. So we've got these kind of two competing things going yeah. on um, in terms of uh, the, the private car. The other thing that we're seeing um, is that consumers are changing their behavior as well, not, not just with car purchases, but other kinds of purchases. So um, whereas perhaps quite a lot of families in the past would have gone food shopping or or shopping say once a week or once every two weeks and then supplemented it with an online shop once a month. In the poll that um, I was referring to earlier, 54% of the respondents said they would be willing to change to online shopping for their food on a permanent basis. 
So this changes the structure of our food supply system in terms of um, how we might treat um, supermarkets and hypermarkets. And um, so I think it's quite, it's quite interesting um, uh, what's going to happen in, in some of those consumer spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, what's interesting about this is that there's, there's, there's two possible scenarios going forward, extremes, if you like. One is, is that um, after coronavirus dies down, say September, um, then we just go back to normal. All right. And so the travel patterns that James displayed on his screen at the start of this talk, um, we go back to more or less the same. The other option is that we have a dramatic change and that a lot of the things that we've seen during coronavirus, the drop in public transport use, the increase in cycling use, um, the increase in the internet use and so on, they, they stay. And, now, and it's like, it's where we end up is likely to be somewhere in between the two. And I think um, there's this, when, when they talk in transport, we talk about the fact that a lot of, of travel behavior is habitual. And the fact that essentially people have a car and they use it the same way all the time because, because their expectations, it's like their norms, their kind of, uh, their heuristics, their, the kind of their normal way of doing things is an easy thing to do. So you, 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 do, you carry out habits because you don't have to think about it. It's simple. And so, so typically, a lot of travel behavior um, is, is based on that. Whereas what's happened with this pandemic is that it's, it's forced people out of their pre-existing habits. And so um, a lot of travel behavior research um, around trying to persuade people not to use their car and to use public transport to walk and cycle instead is predicated on this basis that you target people with interventions to change when they move jobs, when they move house, when they um, have, have a child, when they retire, whatever, lifestyle events. And basically what this pandemic is, it's a lifestyle event. And so on the one hand, there's a lot of people thinking, wow, um, this is a big opportunity to change people's behavior. And that's why, you know, we've seen this big increase in cycling use. How can we allow people to keep that behavior which we want? And that's a positive step. But on the other hand, there is this other thing which is going on, which is basically that um, a lot of people who previously used public transport, as James has just said, will not use it anymore. And so everything sort of in that sense feels up for grabs, really. So I think ultimately we're going to be somewhere between these two extreme cases, but, but no one really knows where exactly. Back to you, James. <laughs> yeah, shall we move on to the, the questions? Yes, please. Okay, so th these are some questions that we thought we'd put out there for you, uh, anyone who's interested basically to, to think about and perhaps to ask us or to discuss. Um, or if you've got your own questions, we'd be, be very um, happy to, to have a think about it and come up with some answers, perhaps. <laughs> so I, I will, um, I'm not willing to take on the first one and say how I think vehicles will be adapted to cope um, with the virus. But um, what I would say is that, uh, again, the hygiene factor and this idea of control um, is going to continue to be with us as, as long as um, things that are contagious are around. Um, and so I think we're going to see um, a continued use of screens and screening and barriers in some transport systems we'll have a lot more timing so that people are spaced out, um, <clears throat> if that makes sense. And, and we might see um, a very, we might, it might feel a little bit draconian, but we might see a, a ticket structure that follows that pathway to kind of spread the peaks of people out um, across our infrastructure. And um, I also think that um, a little bit of a side effect um, on the vehicle side is that um, we might see people leaning a little bit more towards electric vehicles. So they might be saying, um, you know, if I need to upgrade uh, a, a my vehicle, why, why would I get um, 
why would I get a petrol or diesel vehicle if I can have a pure electric and charge it at home? It's a little bit about control again and the hygiene factor that they might go that way. Um, and there might be some other factors that help push that a little bit or pull that, um, such as if the governments um, say, for example, we're going to increase the subsidies that we'd like to give or the rebates we'd like to give on electric vehicle new car purchases to kind of kickstart the market to sort of help GDP along. Um, so I think we, we could see that as being um, one area that might be quite resilient. Um, some other areas that I think will change our travel habits again, our travel patterns, um, is, um, you know, takeaways and deliveries were up by about 45 to 55% during the lockdown. So Uber Eats did very, very well. Uber Taxi perhaps did not do so well. So whether that stays with us um, for the medium term, I think it's likely whether it stays with us for the long term is, is, a, is a question. Um, but it's, cre it's certainly creating some extra journeys that weren't there, um, if you like. And there's a question about um, you know, how society views those extra journeys and also about the carbon count of some of those journeys and, um, and how we see that in the light of everything. Yeah, interesting. I mean, so one I thing, yeah, one thought that, that comes to my mind is, is that um, we at Loughborough, obviously, we have uh, actual live students, physical students normally. But now, but coming um, October, we're going to have to be um, looking at different ways of doing that potentially. Or we've been told that essentially we have to prepare for both uh, students engaging on online platforms like your open university model or um, and physically at the same time. And the idea there is, is that if we suddenly get hit with another localised lockdown as happens in Leicester this morning, then, you know, then we'll be able to still serve our students. But, um, and the implications of that on travel are, are kind of fascinating as well and, and not really worked out. So, so one so, implication yeah. there, um, I mean, your example is a great one about localization is that a lot of these transport systems um, before the virus um, work really well because they're quite big and they cope with scales of people. Um, as you said, it's about supply and demand, but when it becomes much more fragmented and if we have localized lockdowns or if we have different regions doing different things, it does become very messy and we get into kind of a complex systems theory um, where things are quite chaotic and, and um, we're going to need multiple solutions um, to kind of progress things. And I don't think it's going to be an easy situation um, to, to meet everybody's needs if that's the right way to frame this. Yeah, I mean, that again, the localization thing is interesting. I was speaking to a rail operator yesterday, um, East Midlands Railways. And they run uh, long distance services from the East Midlands into London. And they also run a lot of local services between um, sort of from Liverpool across to Skegness and, and uh, around Leicester and, and Nottingham and, and Derby particularly. And, and she was saying that essentially uh, the London market has collapsed. No one's traveling to London at the moment, um, but they have seen quite a lot of people using the local services. Um, so again, there's this, there's this kind of, we're all more local than we've been for a long time, uh, which is, I, I find quite interesting. I've not been out of Bedford since um, since mid-March. I've been in a vehicle once since the lockdown started. We don't own a car. Normally we go by taxi, by bus, by by train, not used anything. And, um, and the idea of going to London is still a bit, well, yeah, we'll have to go one day, but, but actually, <laughs> actually I'm quite happy where I am. <laughs> Yeah, appreciation of where we are. Yeah, I think that's right. It's a really, a really different um, view of mobility in some way. <clears throat> and uh, 
Yeah, and uh, one of the things that society will have to rethink is how much mobility uh, do specific jobs need um, to be really efficient and functional. Um, I mean, it's obvious that a taxi driver and a train driver need to move, um, you know, to do their to do their daily business. Um, but there's quite a lot of people um, in the working world, at least um, in, in, in large pieces of the UK, if they're working in the service society, the service industry, if you like, um, serving society, um, they may be able to continue um, quite well and, uh, and uh, at a quite a good, reasonable, efficient function um, where they don't need to access um, motorized mobility to get that done. So I think um, that we are going to have to think about this and confront it. And we probably need to have a bit of a, a big debate, if you like, uh, and come up to, to some agreement where this will go. Yeah. Do we have any questions? I can't actually see the, the question thing. I managed to switch it off accidentally. Now, I'm just checking um, with Katrina and um, Deborah on my end, and um, they are going to message us directly. Um, and the questions should magically appear on my screen. Um, and what I'll do for the benefit of the rest of the audience is I'll, I'll probably repeat them or relay them. Um, <clears throat> uh, with respect to uh, business models, uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about um, how some of the uh, transport operators that those that provide mm. the supply might sort of change or adapt i mean obviously we're we're in this period where they're in a desperate state um and the, like the demands the bottom has dropped out of demand um and capacities need to be really low to increase space but there's kind of this question you know if you were a transport operator or a train operator how might you diversify or change your offering to to kind of stay in a in a in a in a slightly more healthy financial state? Yeah, well, I wish I had the answer to that, James, because I'd be a you know I'd be a millionaire by <laughs> very soon. I think I think the transport operators now are, are really struggling with this because uh, you take. Um, big bus companies in cities, for instance, and their whole business model is predicated on shifting um, 100 people on a big bus in and out of a city centre in the morning and in the evening. And say you, you transport 100 people, they're paying £2 a head to travel. You know, they make, that's like £200, um, so say two journeys in the morning, £400, and then a journey in the evening, that's £600, and you've paid for the bus, and you've also got money that means you can cross subsidize that route throughout the day and you can then cross subsidize um, across the, the other parts of the network where you're not making as much money and but that means that you're having a hundred person on a big bus 100 people on a big bus but if you can't if you can only put 16 people on a big bus maximum then you're not going to generate that so so there is when it, you might even think thing just disappears because it is all about packing on you know pack, pack them high sell them cheap kind of thing yeah and i was going to say if, if you're only going to have say 16 max and um, you might want to consider downsizing so i'm not saying you can get you know you won't manage to have the space that you need for physical distancing on a small mini bus, but you might be able to go to a slightly smaller bus. Or we may find that buses become, you know, uh, that they have screens or glass pods or something in them, uh, things, you know, in terms of physical barriers. So yeah. I want to bring you back to one of the points you made earlier um, with this first question, which was about um, people working from home and about it being a permanent shift. So if there is a permanent shift towards working at home, um, do you think this would really permanently impact traffic overall? Um, so that's a kind of opener, if you like. And also, um, 
think about this structurally and um, we've had a couple of the audience say you know they have to make an effort to run their car so it doesn't sit so long mm, yeah and and obviously that's an issue so um you know i i'm i'm not going to reveal how ancient my car is but um i have had to get a new battery because it sat for three weeks so um what do you think about that um the, the permanent traffic impact increase from... Okay, the permanent people, traffic, people, yeah. Well, on the one hand, like you say, there will be more people um, travelling by car because they've switched from public transport. On the other hand, I reckon that we'll see a lot less people um, commuting in the peak. Well, not a lot less people. Maybe maybe 20% of people will be commuting, I mean, uh, working from home instead of 5%, let's say. And if that's the case then in the peaks the hopefully the there'll be a bit of balancing there um yeah people not using their cars yeah, yeah I think, that one. so here's my take on that if people stop using their cars or if they really reduce your cars and um, if you could remind us there's a break-even point where it's no longer financially viable to own a car and it gets cheaper to start renting it or using a car club. Yeah, well, that's about, is it about 8,000 miles or something? I think it could be something like that. Um, it's certainly down around three to 5,000 miles. Owning a car, um, really, the cost of that per distance mm. is, 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 is not great. Um, I want to take you to the next question, which I think is really interesting. It touches on electric mobility and um, um, somebody's written in and said um, I'm disabled and I use an electric mobility scooter and it's got a range and a charge of about 25 miles and um, what do you think about non-disabled people using these in terms of um, could we ever see that market take off? Yes we could I don't know whether it's desirable but I think we could certainly do that yeah, um, that's actually the micro mobility thing. Um, electric bikes, bicycles, and walking generally, that is the other missing link that we haven't talked about really today very much. Um, and if you can't put people on public transport systems, then there is this thing is it 60% of all journeys are less than five miles? That's right. So, if so, five miles is a good distance on a bicycle, um, and you might cycle if the conditions on the road are conducive to let you do that, which often they're not. So <laughs> these things with the pop-up cycle lanes um, that you were mentioning, the widened footpaths and so on, um, it could be quite an important intervention to massively increase cycling. Whether we've missed the boat now, what, during the, the lockdown, there was some money came from government to allow local councils to put in these pop-up cycle lanes. And a lot of councils spent money um, putting in pop-up cycle lanes but of course that takes away road space from buses and it takes road space away from cars and lorries and so on so there's always a political choice to make but if if we could increase cycling um, significantly and a part of that a big part of that could be electric bikes and another part of that could be electric scooters which are now being this morning they've been given the go-ahead for trials in certain towns and cities across the UK Okay. Now, the problem with electric um, e-scooters is, is how do you regulate them and how do you make sure that, um, you know, you get the odd uh, idiot on a bicycle, never mind on, a, on an e-scooter. But, you know, there are problems if, if e-scooters are used, um, say, on, on footpaths, they can they've knock down people. Someone in Paris was killed on a footway. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So but there's a, there's a, we shouldn't call them idiots, but people that don't obey the regulations. Yeah, exactly. And they don't, and they're not safety. safety. Exactly. So it's like, so I think that this sort of e-mobility, on the one hand, there are lots of benefits. If you can, if people will use that, an e-scooter instead of a car, then that's, that I think is probably a good thing in terms of saving space and pollution and so on. But there, there could also be a, a negative thing in terms of um yeah accidents and and safety and so on so it'll have to be done carefully i think so yeah um, i've got a couple more questions um coming in on the youtube here and um, a couple about um aviation uh which is 
interesting. Mm. And, um, Kevin asks, um, what implications does this have for the third way at Heathrow? And if we're on infrastructure um, and big things that are expensive, what about HS2? Mm. Yeah, well, I think Heathrow third runway, if I, if I had to put my, uh, if I had to make a, a thing, I, I think that Heathrow runway three is gone. I think that Boris Johnson, the prime minister has never been keen on it. How long he survives another issue. But, um, and then uh, I think as well, the high court judgment earlier in the year or late last year about um, it breaking carbon targets and so on. That's right. And then I think as well that, that there is business travel is a big market for, for aviation. And, um, and I think what the, the pandemic has done is it, it's, it's made employers realize that actually a lot of business trips are maybe not that necessary. So, yeah, I we mean, we might have a rethinking around yeah, there could be a rethink. and and one of the main arguments for HS two, I yeah. think I got this right, was that the time savings would be so substantial that HS two would be much better than other rail lines mm. and less crowded. But if we see all of demand dropping then the financial calculation for HS2 is, yeah. I don't want to say it's on shaky ground, but it's certainly on a different, framed yeah. in a different way. And sure. Now, um, we showed that um, mock-up of the aircraft cabin, and Jenny asked, um, if cabins had to be reconfigured for distancing, um, what's the likely cost implications on airline ticket prices? Um, for consumers um, to recoup the cost and maintain route viability. Yeah. So what do you think about the three yeah, well, going to one to, to one plus one to two, then, you know, typically before coronavirus, let's say occupancy on, on aviation was probably around in the high 80%. If we see it being more down around 50%, well, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, crudely, I suppose if if you're going down from three seats across to two seats, then you you're reducing your revenues by what um, a third. A third. So yeah. you're putting the you basically you're raising ticket prices by what the same fifty percent. I think so, something like that, probably around forty percent. Yeah. Um, and also um, maintaining route <clears throat> viability is a really interesting question. Yeah, I thought um, go on they. I mean, the other thing with aviation, they're talking about super jumbos, your big A380 aircrafts, um, never flying again. I saw something. I, th I think that's that. true. Well, we've certainly Four seen. Seven phased out. Yeah. Yeah, the structural change there has happened very quickly. So, um, if we just give three examples, so British Airways, Lufthansa, and KLM, were all getting ready to discontinue the 747, is that 700 series, um, four engines um, in the next year or so. And they've all, all three of them have already more or less scrapped them and retired them. And as you say, the A380, there's very few of those um, still running um, because there's no demand um, to, to fill them. So um, with maintaining root viability, I think that's also a very interesting question. It's not just about um, the vehicle, the point to point vehicle. So are you Boeing or are you Airbus and how many seats are you running and what's your efficiency? But it's also the structure. So what we've also seen, um, it was reported in The Economist recently that um, the company that runs Gatwick Airport says they're looking at a four to six year program to get back to profitability and be normal again. And so you've seen quite a lot of airlines pull away um, from that base because it's much cheaper to maintain one London base or a, a smaller set of bases um, for their network. And so route viability is going to be 
I mean, I think what we would say is it's probably going to be a lot different. And so there will be less choice for point to point and less destinations from um, fewer origins, if that's the right way to yeah. categorize this. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, not to that. There was another thing that I just suddenly thought about, though, is like the viability of the high street, for instance. And that's something that is also suffering. So I think what, what the pandemic will do, um, we were talking about, you know, will we go back to normal or will things irrevocably change? And I think that actually, in a lot of cases, for a lot of examples, things that were already happening structurally um, will be accelerated by coronavirus. So before um, the pandemic, um, bus travel had been declining for a long time. Even in London, it's been declining since um, sort of the mid 2019, no, the tw- 20 teens. <laughs> um, but in the rest of the UK, it's been declining since about the 1950s. And it's all to do with how people are, uh, are living differently and the, the lifestyles they have and, and where they live. And the fact that their jobs are not in city centres anymore, they're on the edge of town and and so on. Um, so there's structural changes there. And similarly with a high street, we already saw that shops were closing uh, in a lot of high street in Bedford. We lost all kinds of, of shops. Uh, and a lot of those will now end up being permanently closed. A lot of bus routes that were previously viable probably won't be anymore after this. So... So what the pandemic is doing is it's basically shaking up a lot of, um, I don't want to say trends, but a lot because it's shaking up people's behaviours in, in, a, in a range of different ways, such that I think that things that were already starting to fail will fail more quickly than they would have done otherwise. I think um, that's right. And I think the other thing it's doing... Um, to users of transport systems everywhere is it's making them sort of think again, um, as you noted there about the cars, uh, the level mm-hmm. of car use during lockdown was in the 1950s, um, which is fantastic in terms of emissions and impacts. So accidents went down um, you know, lots of mm-hmm. positive uh, secondary or tertiary effects. However, you have to remember that mobility also went down. And so there's a question for ourselves about how much mobility is reasonable. Um, And I think there's also a question too, that even those carbon dioxide emissions and our impact has gone down quite a bit, it hasn't gone down to where it needs to get to. So, this is only a small slice, if you like, and there's lots of other sectors where CO2 has probably stayed the same or gone up a little bit or, you know, so I think that's something yeah. uh, we, we want to have as a final point. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't see any more questions at the moment. We're very happy to take questions in the chat or via the email um, shown there on the screen, stem-news at open.ac. Dot UK. Um, and both of us would like to say a very warm thank you for listening and do feel free to send us a question or send us your thoughts um, via the feed. It's been really nice um, to share our thoughts with you about transport um, during this lunchtime talk. And um, we'll put up the photo credits at the end. We'd also like to say thanks to all those whose images we've used today to help illustrate our talk. So thank you, Marcus. Thanks, James.